Hey guys, today we're going to be talking about our essential question, which is, what's more important, what we say, how we say it, or what we truly mean? This question can be seen throughout all the six novels we've read this semester, and is usually one of the main themes of the novels. So sit back, relax, and enjoy our video. Ellie and thousands of other Jews fall victim to the Nazis' cruelty at night. Through their oppression, they begin to slowly lose their voice. It is their silence that ultimately ends up speaking for them. This brings us to the question of how does silence speak for us? At this point in the book, Ellie and the other Jews have all just celebrated a new year, but he and his father have lost all hopes for being released from a concentration camp. They have nothing to say because they all understand the reality that they're living in and to some extent learn to accept this. By accepting this, this is when all of the characters lose their faith. The idea is also brought up in Slaughterhouse-Five when the Englishmen talk about the consequences of ceasing to care about yourself, which is ultimately death. The Englishman's philosophy was proven at night because once the Jews gave up hope, it made it easier for them to die. After having been expelled from his boarding school, Holden Caulfield travels New York City and discovers that there is no innocence in an adult's world. Holden makes a big transformation from the beginning of the book to the end. This can be seen in one part of the book when he's talking to his little sister Phoebe and he tells her what his dream job is, which is to catch little kids who are falling off a cliff. This is a metaphor for him trying to save children from losing their innocence, which is an unpreventable thing and it's absurd, absurd for him to want to do that because that's not possible. Holden's change can be seen at the end of the book when his little sister Phoebe is riding on a carousel and starts to reach for the gold ring which kind of scares him but he admits that if a child is gonna reach for the gold ring you should let them which is pretty much saying that you need to give the child room to grow and develop. The plot of As I Lay Dying pales in comparison to the way the story is told, which is through the eyes of several characters. Each individual character has their own thought process, which leads to several different ways of telling the same story. This may cause the reader to wonder while reading the book, how does our perception affect the way we view the world? This quote shows that each individual in society has their own perception and can cause them to view the same person differently. In A Good Man is Hard to Find, the title contradicts the entire meaning of the book because none of the characters in the story were good men, which leads us to the question of what is a good man? Just like in As I Lay Dying, each individual character's perception determines who the good man is. In O'Connor's story, The River, Harry Ashfield is viewed as a naive little boy who's easy to pick on by his peers, a marvel by his babysitter Mrs. Conan, and a slight inconvenience by his parents. Throughout a separate piece, Gene struggles with his desires to become like his friend Phineas. He constantly says one thing and does another, and he envies Phineas' ability to remain completely pure and oblivious to Gene's corrupted adult mind. Throughout the entire novel, Gene strives to be just like Phineas and winds up hurting him physically and mentally, and in the end, indirectly kills him. Gene then describes that he has discovered that the true enemy that he fought was within the school and within himself and that caused him to have such envy and jealousy towards his friend. Jean fails to realize that Phineas really does see him as the best friend and that Phineas would never intentionally try to harm Jean. But Jean is convinced that him and Phineas have some sort of feud going on and until what's really bothering him is gone, which is Phineas's innocence, he will stop at nothing to get rid of this innocence and it causes Phineas to die. Jean was always jealous of Phineas because of his ability to be pure and 
young and that was something Jean was not. The fact that Phineas was innocent drove Jean insane. In Slaughterhouse-Five, Billy becomes unstuck in time and throughout his experiences, he has odd encounters with some parts of his life that he never really wanted to go to. Which brings us to the question, how much of our lives are predetermined? God grant me the serenity to change the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom always to tell the difference. Among the things Billy Pilgrim could not change were the past, the present, and the future. Billy's passivity and ability to accept anything that comes at him and have no desire to change it solidifies and stresses Vonnegut's point that he's trying to get across, which is don't be passive, don't let things just happen. Once again, the essential question that we were focusing on was, what's most important, what we say, how we say it, or what we really mean? Hope that you guys enjoyed this video. Bye!